reading from Romans chapter 12, verses 9 through 21. Let love be genuine. Hate what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not lag in zeal. Be ardent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in suffering. Persevere in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints. Extend hospitality to strangers. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. With, rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. If it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. No, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink, for by doing this, you will heap burning coals on their heads. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Good morning. My name is Sean Devilites, and I'm one of the pastors here at Braddock Street United Methodist Church. And today we continue our series on the anatomy of peace as we look to be a better equipped community to resolve conflict. Last week, we learned about the importance of seeing a person as a person rather than as an object. Today, we look at what it can be like if we allow God to direct our choices so that our hearts are not limited within the boxes that we construct. Will you all pray with me? Compassionate and just God, we give thanks that you never stop calling us to grow. May this morning be an opportunity for us to push beyond what is comfortable for the sake of what is better in your sight. Tune our hearts so that we may be instruments of your grace. And bless this time that we may learn more about others, more about ourselves, and more about you. We love you. Amen. It has been one of those months in the Devilites household, perhaps your household can relate to this, that has included a lot of time in the car. Some of it is for work, some of it is to go visit family, uh, some of it is just to run errands, but whatever the reason may be, I have found myself behind the wheel of a vehicle quite a bit. And so that has provided me this ample opportunity to reflect on my gifts and my graces as a driver. It has also given me the opportunity to reflect on the gifts and graces, or lack thereof, of the other drivers that we have encountered. You see, it never ceases to amaze me as I witness the different habits of drivers from different particular areas, the things that were instilled in them depending on where they live. For example, if the license plate of a car indicates that a person lives in Maryland, that person is required to not use their blinker. In other areas, it is proper to anticipate that a left turn that is coming needs to be signaled by driving five below in the left lane for the 10 miles prior <laughs> with the blinker on. And see, I can joke about this because I'm a native of the area of this lovely state that is called Northern Virginia. Therefore, that is also the area that I learned how to drive. My instructor taught us, uh, rather than the defensive driving that I think was normal curriculum, uh, we were taught to be offensive drivers. 
the irony of that term was, was lost on all of us at the time, that we are to aspire to be offensive drivers, but we'll, we'll move on. Because basically we were supposed to pay just enough attention that we can anticipate what another driver wanted to do, whether they were like wavering back and forth in their lane like they were trying to get over, realize what we wanted to do and take action and make sure that we got to get where we needed to go. See, since, since moving to Winchester, I've come to understand that that's not the way that you're supposed to do things. <laughs> I, I will still petition that when you come to a four-way stop, please go if it is your turn. You do not have to wait for me. But aside from that, the driving here is so much different from where I grew up that I realized that in a lot of ways, I'm an aggressive driver. But I guess that makes sense growing up in the land where it sometimes takes you 45 minutes to an hour on a good day to drive 10 miles or so down the road. Um, the, the time you have when you can actually press your accelerator down is like this holy moment where I'm from, that you can actually move your car and gain speed while you're going. Anything that lets you escape the confines of the pavement around you on your morning commute. And one of the recent car rides this month had me somewhere in that wilderness that is located between the Dulles Toll Road and the Beltway. I was with my people, in other words. And I was sitting in line to take this one particular exit. And then along comes that guy. You know which guy. The one driving the oversized SUV that pretended to not see the sign and so skipped all through past the line and was trying to merge right before the exit. God bless that person. <laughs> <laughs> and for this brief, brief moment, I felt this nudge that must have come from God, because I would not have listened to any other source, to just let the guy merge over. We were all going to get to where we were going. It's all going to be okay. Just create a space for this guy. And then just as suddenly I was filled with a whole host of increasingly ridiculous reasons to not adhere to that nudge. <laughs> no one ever lets me over when I'm trying to get there. Who's this guy I think he is anyway, just cutting us all off? He didn't even, the last person I let over didn't even wave to me when I let them cut me off. I ought to teach this guy a lesson. I'm going to defend myself like I needed defending. I'm going to defend my space and become so overcome that I found myself sitting proudly behind the wheel when I stuck so close to the person in front of me that that guy had to wait. I won. <laughs> and then when I was safely cleared of the opportunity to be a better person, uh, I got this sense that perhaps I messed up. If you talk to some of my colleagues that work in churches uh, from where I grew up, a lot of them don't put their church bumper sticker on their car. <laughs> now you have a reason why. And friends, I tell this story because this week we are seeing how we have a choice as to whether we see people as objects or as people. It's what the Anatomy of Peace book that we are working through describes as a choice diagram where we have the opportunity to honor the sense that likely comes from God, and in this particular context for me, letting the driver of the SUV merge into the turn lane, if I was willing to see the driver as a person and honor that, then perhaps my heart would be at peace. But no, I betrayed that sense. I saw the driver as the SUV that he inhabited, and my heart went to war. Friends, this gives us this opportunity, as you reflect on the story, to know that this diagram doesn't just refer to driving, as much fun as that would be. It's one that we use as a lens to look at all sorts of other scenarios. So if you go further into the betraying the sense, you start to figure out why you might choose to do that. And the Anatomy of Peace book describes us as having these boxes. So you can bring those up. Uh, just so you know, you do not have to read all of the words on the screen. But know that there are four boxes up here that are better than, I deserve, must be seen as, and worse than. And each box refers to, in those contexts, a view of ourselves, a view of others, our feelings, and our understanding of the world in the midst of it. So, given the example of me in a turn lane, I was right 
probably in the intersection of that better than box right in the middle. I was a better driver because I knew when to merge over the first time. I was a better person because I clearly knew how to operate a vehicle more so than this other person did. Because, you know, there are people who can drive and there are people who can't, and there's never anybody who can around you when you're on the road. None of them can. My view of the world was this competitive nature where the very 12 feet in front of my car had to be claimed as if it was going to be stolen from me, which it was, by the way. Um, and our feelings of impatience and disdain for those around us, which just seems to be amplified on the roads at times, um, all of that is wrapped up in that understanding of being better than this other person. I will probably never know who was in that car. I will never know why they needed to get over. I will never know where they were coming from or where they were going. All that mattered was that I saw myself as being better than them, and I did not let them in. These boxes will be up on our website in the coming days, so you have an opportunity to look further into them and see the differences of, of ways you can view yourself in that. Um, but the thing that's important for us this morning to know is that these boxes that have gone away on our screen don't go away from us as easily. It takes an incredible amount of work to be willing to even step out of those boxes. And so as we talk about that concept of getting out of the box, that's what we are referring to this morning. Because in a lot of ways, those boxes make sense. Our life experience comes in such a way that the places we get hurt, the injustices that we perceive, our struggles and our stories lend us to winding up in one of those boxes. The challenge for us is to not let those boxes become what defines us, but instead be defined by who God calls us to be. And friends, that involves us having to understand that as much as it helps us to understand things, to build boxes, and to have everything kind of fit into it real nice, we cannot do that with our God. Our God does not fit inside of a box, and our God's love is beyond any kind of containment. And therefore, we were created in a similar way, to not be limited or contained to some kind of descriptive box. We were created for more. And that call to be more, to be greater than uh, what we could settle for, if you will, isn't new. See, the struggle of us seeing the people around us as objects and looking through our boxes is one that the community of people that we call the church has struggled with and continues to struggle with. Paul's letter to the early Christian church in Rome was written to a community that was pretty divided between a Jewish population that had converted to Christianity and brought with them their story and their heritage and their tradition and their practices, and a Gentile community, which essentially means they weren't Jewish before, that had converted and just believed in Christ, and that was why they were there. And so you can imagine with those boxes up there, which side might think the other was better, and what value was placed on each of those things or not placed on each of those things. The conflict that would take place. The theological discussion that Paul would have found himself in as he tries to pastor this community through their troubles. As Paul tries to affirm the Gentiles' faith while also affirming Israel's role in God's purpose, he speaks this truth that seems kind of like it's too easy to be true. Be loving towards one another. It's not about the faith versus works argument if you get so caught up in the argument that you cease to do what God has called you to do. See, if the anatomy of peace was 2,000 years older and written in Greek, perhaps Paul may have used more of this kind of language as he pastored this community. But alas, we just keep being reminded, do the right thing. There's a, the, the verse in there where it talks about how, you know, bless those who persecute you. Again, I say bless them. This is something that would have been read out loud to the community. So it's because they wouldn't believe it the first time they heard it. Bless those who persecute you. No, that's not a typo. Bless them. Be loving towards them. Overcome evil with good. 
Do not be overcome by that sense of entitlement or that sense of anything that would take you away from where God is nudging you to be. Friends, if we could do that, it would be music to God's ears, just as the music that we include in worship today is music to God's ears. And yet the powers and principalities of this world work in such a way that we struggle, or at least I struggle, to even let somebody into my lane. Nevertheless, God continues to call us to persist, to pray, and to work. Just as God called all of the folks that claim to be Christians throughout all of history to do that same work and will continue until this world is put back to rights, God calls us to persist, even in the face of where it seems there's nothing good that can come. And so this morning, we are given the opportunity to answer two questions. What is God nudging you to do? What is God nudging me to do? And what boxes are in our way that we need to overcome? Because we're in the midst of a time where our struggles span from those that we encounter in our day-to-day life to these theological discussions that are driving the future of our church. They're driving the future of Methodism. That are driving the future of people's faith and their opportunity to feel like they can belong to a community where they are supposed to feel loved. And in all of those places, God is nudging us away from those super tempting boxes. And in all those places, we have to get out of those boxes. When you think of all the people you encounter in your life, how many of them are reduced to being a caricature, as SUV man was for me? (laughs) What ways do we need to find a better option than thinking of ourselves as better than, more deserving, in need of looking a certain way, or worse than? In what ways do we fail to hold ourselves to the same standard that we attempt to hold everyone else to? As we seek to move our hearts from war to peace, these are questions that we're seeking to answer, but they're also questions that we are called by God to have an answer for. Because if we begin this conversation of seeing others as people rather than objects, we have to understand that to get there, we have to be willing to work in ourselves First, as much as it would make me rejoice if everyone drove like I did, that would also be a terrifying reality that we would live in. It's not about all of us doing the exact same thing. It's about making room for us to be the people that God has called each of us, each and every one of us individually to be. Friends, we live in a time where the good news for someone is that simple truth. That who they are is a sacred creation of God. That God loves them the way that they are. That alone will stop tears from falling. (laughs) That alone will give hope to folks who don't hear that from anyone else that do not know that they are defined by a God who loves them so much that God never stops going after them rather than facing the descriptions that someone else can muster up without really caring, describing them for what they do or for who they are or for what they look like rather than acknowledging that they are a child of God. Imagine the witness if we could be, imagine the witness we could be to talk with others as if they are more than the vehicles that they ride in more than the bumper stickers that may or may not be on their car, more than the poor decision or the mistake that led them to being in some unfortunate situation in the first place. Friends, even if we're not there yet, nevertheless, we persist. We continue to answer God's call to work towards that great peace that is not the absence of conflict, but is the true presence of peace, until every box is unpacked, until there is a space created for everyone, until we taste that heart of peace. Will you all pray with me? God, we give you thanks for all the stories that are embodied by the people in this room. 
We give thanks for the ways that you have acted in all of our lives to lead us here at this time and in this place. And as you wrestle with conversations that either seem like they should have happened long ago or that we shouldn't have them yet, or seem incredibly complicated or too easy to be dealing with, we give thanks because you are present with us in the midst of it all. And as we come here, whether it is joyful or heavy laden, we know that we have a sacred story to share and also that there are plenty of other sacred stories to hear from one another. God, amidst all of those journeys that we are on, we lift up the members of our community that have been named in prayer, like Dr. Andrew, Harold Ogg, Alyssa Farquhar, Katie Chapman, Bruce Jackson, Donna Nepp, Norris Wilson, Wayne Dick, Dennis Bromley, Harold Madigan, Jessica Marlowe, George Morris, Dennis Hinkle, Dick Harmison, Suzanne Brannon, the Sheila Baker family, George Quarles, Wendell Dick, the Wilbur Feltner family, the Ann Kellican family, the homeless, those without jobs, those serving away from home, the volcano victims in Hawaii and victims of other natural disasters, the Jerry Kerr family, and also those that we name on our hearts right now. And God, on this day, we also take the chance to celebrate and name the women who have given us life and love, that we may show them reverence and love as well. For the mothers who have been there and, and been there to support us on our journey, for the mothers who have lost a child through death, we ask their faith may give them hope and that we as their family and friends may support and console them. For women, though, without children of their own, have like mothers nurtured and cared for many that we don't even know. For the mothers who have been unable to be a source of strength themselves, we acknowledge that you are with them and their families and healing them each day. Loving God, as a mother gives life and nourishment to her children, so you watch over your church. Bless all of your women, that they may be strengthened as Christian mothers and as Christian leaders. Affirm their calls. Reveal the ways that you continue to work through them in a special way. Let the example of their faith and love shine forth and grant that we, their sons and daughters, may honor them always with a spirit of profound respect. Grant this through Christ our Lord, who has also taught us to pray. As we say, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever.